Somebody came here, Red Rose Radio, for a job. We wouldn't ask them anything like, can you do the job? Are you any good? We'll say, how many kids have you got? Six kids are not having you. We'd have to pay you too much. Get out. Surely a minimum wage is something that everyone should know they're entitled to, and they should decide on how many children they have in their bed, not in their wallet. Quite right. So, tell me again, what is the number? In this day and age, I would think £120 a week. £120 a week minimum. Is a, is a fair figure for a minimum wage. Well, an awful lot of people don't earn that, as I'm sure you're aware. I'm, I'm Do you believe that every person that doesn't earn that as a minimum, we're talking that about an adult wage, we're not including 16, 17, right. up to 21. Right. At the age of 21, let's say, in your view, they should be pulling 120 notes a week. Oh, if they're not pulling that, what should they do? Well, it shouldn't be a case of that. That should be a minimum wage. And that well, it's not. So if they're not wage. getting a living wage that you see should be legally enforceable, how do they enforce it? If there's no law to provide them with it, how are they going to enforce well, that's it? that's my point. There should be a law to enforce it. Well, there isn't. So, well, well, it's no good carrying on getting £16 a week or £60 a week saying, I wish there was a law to enforce it. You've got to do something about enforcing it yourself. So what do they do? They go on strike. That's right. Now, who do you think? What section of society should be forced to work for less than £120 a week? Well, as you said yourself, uh, an adult wage is an adult wage. You know, anybody underneath an adult, uh, school leavers, trainees, apprentices, that sort of thing, fair enough, that should be a lower wage. If you're learning a job, then it's a lower wage. You've accepted that. I think that's quite fair. Once you are as high qualified in your job as you're going to be, and that is your chosen profession, then you should be able to go into that profession knowing that your standard of living is going to be secure. Then let me ask you the next before. question, Tommy. You're obviously not going to be forced into the position because you saw it coming. You're not going to be forced into the position of saying that an individual on less than £120 a week should be entitled to strike, because, of course, I'm going to throw all kinds of occupations at you where they get less than that and shouldn't be entitled to, in your view. Right so, on. tell me, then, how do you propose getting this basic minimum wage made statutory? Well, it, it's not so long ago, Alan, that the, you, had a, you had conferences, political party conferences. I won't name which one, because you probably cut me off. No, it's the Labour Party conference, the one you're referring the, to. The, the, the union uh, chorus in that caucus in that uh, assembly mm -hmm. decided that there would be a, a minimum wage which would be legally enforced by a government. And look what has happened to the Labour Party standing since then. Well, yeah, but I don't it's think climbing out of a hole now. Well, let's, let's have it right. well, I don't think that's down to that particular... Well, we have to consider whether it is or whether it isn't, don't we? I was at a, a meeting on... Well, it wasn't a meeting, it was a dinner. I was an after-dinner speaker on Saturday, after, Saturday evening and I was talking to somebody who'd been brought up working class all her life and she sat there and told me that she could now not afford to vote Labour because the policies they would bring in would take away the rewards that they, that's her and her husband, believe they have earned. And so they're not voting Labour. Now, there must be thousands of people like that throughout the country. Those people are not going to vote Labour because it's going to cost them brass. And the brass that they're going to cost is so that the Labour Party can then force others to earn 120 quid a week. Well, well, somebody's got to pay it. Who's going to pay it? At the end of the day, Alan, you've got to think about society as a whole. And society as a well, whole you have. I've got to think about whatever I feel like. Well, and the average well, voter... Yeah, but what I'm saying to you is the average voter thinks often selfishly. Now, the Labour Party's got this wonderful idea of paying everybody 120 quid a week. Unfortunately, everybody's saying nothing doing, Jack. We don't want 120 quid a week. Get shut of the Labour Party. Let's have the Liberals. That's right. You see, the problem though is, is Alan, and it's going to be a problem for society as a whole. Society's quite happy to be a, a selfish individual. Yes. Right? How do you propose to change that then? Well, you're not going to change it. Yeah, yeah. Well, now that we've established that you're not going to change that, we accept as, a, as an inevitable consequence of not being able to change that, the inevitable consequence that we're not going to get a basic minimum wage of 120 quid a week because the rich aren't going to vote for it and we need the rich to vote for it in order to get it in. Right. So then we're left with these people who don't get 120 quid a week, in your view, are not able to live reasonably on less than 120 quid a week. And we're back with a question you wouldn't answer before. What do they do? Well, I'm not, I'm not for taking away the right to strike from anybody, <laughs> right? I've never been... That isn't what you said earlier. You it oh, it no, isn't I what you said earlier. I said, I, said it's not, I said I can see the point from both sides, right? Now, the right to strike is inherent in everybody, right? Everybody, in this, as a human being, you have the right to withdraw your labour, or you should have. Certain professions are not. Right. Now, let me ask what you a question. Let me ask you a question now that I'm not going to allow a middle of the road fence sitting answer. The professions that are not allowed to strike, do you think that they have a basic 
human right to do so despite the law? Yes, I do. We rest our case. I do. But That's fine. You believe but that everybody has the right to strike. I do. In I'm not going to argue with that. In theory, right. So we're agreed well, on that. Well, I'm not interested in theory. They either have the right or they do not. They do have the right, right? The well, there's no problem. No, my point is, right, Alan, that, sir, you, see, you made a little remark in your, in your little speech to the first lad. I know I admit his intelligence must be slightly low because I can still. Never mind insulting him, he's but, probably still listening. Well, I'm upset yeah. the lad, he'd be crying his eyes out. Right, what's well, a shame, isn't it? Anyway, that lad, you made a remark to him that he mentioned something about the police don't want strike, and you said to him, the police get re financially remunerated accordingly. Bastard. Right? Will you tell your friend if he opens his mouth again, you will disappear, not him? Hang on. Right, anyway, you made a remark about the police. Good night. Tell your friend he is an intellectual buffoon and I have no desire to listen to his puerile remarks. Should he ever grow up, we hope the world doesn't discover it. Chopper, I need to ask you about money. Money, Master? Yes. I need a way of looking after my day-to-day -day finances. Then go to Britannia, Master. A building society? Yes, Master. Their new account offers the facilities a bank account does, plus interest. Everything, Tinny Papa? Including a checkbook and a cash car? Yes, Master. Which means cash from over 800 linked dispensers. Hmm. Just what I need. What is this account called, Woodchapa? Money, Master. Money, Gobstopper? No, Money Master, Master. Hmm. Money Master, bank account facilities, building society interest, and your nearest Britannia Building Society branch now. Deal direct with Direct Windows. Direct Windows, the best way to buy UPVC windows and doors in Lancashire. We install the superb Bowwater Halo system, and all work is guaranteed and underwritten at Lloyd's of London. Buy direct, avoid the middleman, and make hard cash savings. Visit the new factory showroom seven days a week at 64 Red Scar Estate, Long Ridge Road. Or phone Paul Kelly on Preston 703008. Deal direct with Direct Windows. Direct with Direct Windows. Hello, I'm Mike Henfield with news of a new series of late night programmes on Red Rose Radio starting at the end of April. Ask Lydia is our new weekly advice column of the airwaves. Lydia will answer your personal problems with wise guidance, straight talking and, where necessary, a touch of humour. You can write to Lydia on absolutely anything. Sex problems, financial difficulties, domestic troubles, any other matter that's worrying you. You don't have to give your full name and address, just your first name and the area you live in. You can even use a pen name. So write to Ask Lydia, that's L-Y-D-I-A, at Red Rose Radio, P.O. Box 301, Preston. And the first half-hour programme will be at 10 o'clock on Tuesday, April the 28th, with Alan Bezik starting at 10.30. Good old Lydia giving me half an hour off. Don't forget, address your letters to Lydia. You don't have to give your real name if you don't want, and she will answer your letters on the air with Mike. Tuesday evenings, 10 till 10.30 or thereabouts, depending on how busy it is. But we won't be doing them all, so do please get your letters in as soon as you can. How do, Steve? Hello, Alan. Uh, I'm also following up, uh, as your last two callers, about the uh, Department of Health and Social Security being on strike at the moment. Uh, one of the things in the news that I've been listening to uh, on the TV is they, their main argument seems to be that uh, some of the claimants are actually getting more money than themselves, yeah? I don't know that that's their main argument. They well, cite means... that as evidence of how badly they're paid. Uh -huh. But does that mean that anybody in a public service uh, industry isn't going to save anybody who earns more than them? You know, like a fireman uh, goes to a house and says, I'm not, I'm not putting his fire out because he earns more than me. It's an, <laughs> it's an interesting corollary, but I don't think that is what they're saying at all. What they're saying is, why should we pay money out to individuals who get more than we get for doing it? Oh, uh, when oh, they do nothing for it. Oh, now I don't fully understand. I don't fully agree with their point of view, but it's uh, it's valid. One has to sit and think about that. Well, I wasn't. I was, actually, I wasn't aware it was actually their money. Here. I thought you know. It uh, isn't their money, but yeah. it, I didn't well, say it was their money. Uh, we pay out. 
Well, they pay it out. They're the ones that... the government pays it out. No, they pay it out. The government supply the money, but they actually do the paying. It must be quite galling to sit there on, as our earlier caller was saying, on £68 a week, writing cheques for 140 to some individual who is not working. Now, I accept that the individual who's not working probably would love to work and may even be prepared to do the job of the person that's getting 68 notes. Well, not quite. That was, uh, that was my argument exactly. Uh, I was just disappointed that they seem to be picking on the weakest people. Who I don't think they are themselves. picking on the weakest people. They're not saying it's their fault. The mm -hmm. point, when, when you start saying we don't get much money, we've all heard that, haven't we? Mm -hmm. The yeah, media who, don't pick up... That? Do you mean the people on the dole or the, the actual... In the case in the case of this dispute, where I'm talking about the people in the dispute, the DHSS employees, mm -hmm. now they've got to find some way of getting the media to report their low income. Mm -hmm. And in order to get the media, and I know this from trying to get my own publicity in papers and the like, and in order to get your publicity in the papers, you've got to give them a nuke. You've got to give the journalist something interesting to report. Now, there's nothing interesting these days in saying I'm not getting paid enough. Everybody's saying it, including me at times. Nobody listens, unfortunately. But what you've got to do is find some way of displaying that. An analogy might work. But in their case, they've got this very real example that there are individuals paying out money in benefits to those who are not working that are greater than the earnings of the person doing the paying in terms of the physical act of paying. To be honest, I don't really see that as any relevant point, you know. It isn't relevant, but if it gets the issue into the newspapers, on the news and on Alan Bezik's programme, then you get the issue discussed. Mm -hmm. it, it isn't actually just the DHSS who are going to carry out this strike, is it? It's the whole civil service as a whole. It is the whole civil service, well, but I the one that is going to show itself mostly what is I, the one of the benefit pay. Yeah, what I actually wonder is, is why actually start with people who are on the door when surely the, this government's in a, you know, its present way of thinking is surely going to be happy with that because it's money that they're paying out not money that's coming Well they're not going to be happy with it in. because they're going to have to pay they're going to have to pay it out anyway they're not going to make a saving are they? Well, they will in the interest that it's going to mount up in banks, actually, won't Well, it? unfortunately, the government doesn't get interest on its money like that. It's it's not like you and me, you know. No, but they do, they do actually get... <laughs> in fact, the government's, they, they the government's out almost out always overdrawn. <laughs> yeah, but they actually lend it out and get interest. Now, I was wondering why... Why didn't, the, you know, the Inland Revenue, for example, go on strike first, which would surely... Cause well, the Inland Revenue were on strike and have actually been in dispute for, I think, about two years. Yeah, but they haven't actually withdrawn their... their oh, they uh, did. Employment totally shut they down did often. Like the DHSF, have they? No, they have done, yes. <laughs> no, I don't think they have, actually, have I'm not over-bothered that you don't think they have, I'm telling you they have. Yeah, they've just shut down for six weeks and said that's it. They didn't so shut down all over the place for six weeks, but there are sections of it that have been closing down all over the place and then opening again later and all sorts of problems being created. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right? OK. Anyway, you and me aren't going to solve it, are we? No. More's the pity else. We'd solve it overnight. We'd have everybody working. Then we won't need all these people on the DHSS. Yeah. <laughs> See you, Steve. Bye now. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, before I begin, a brief word about low finance from only 2.5% on Ford Fiestas at Bradshaw's Marsh Lane, Preston. With the details on the first. Any questions? You're better off at Bradshaw's! A far, far better furniture store! Edmondson's of Blackburn, a far, far better furniture store for lounge, dining room and bedroom furniture, for famous names and quality carpets, for all home furnishings. Edmondson's offers choice, Edmondson's gives first-class service and Edmondson's guarantees value for money. All round a far, far better furniture store at Darwin Street, Blackburn. A far, far better furniture store, Edmondson's. Tom Jones from Minus Sun to Megastar from 1964 to 1987 and a string of hits that include such classics as The Green Green Grass, Delilah Help Yourself, What's New Pussycat and It's Not Unusual. I'm Ian Lonsdale and I'll be talking to Tom Jones on Wednesday the 8th of April between 4 and 5 in the afternoon. To find out more about the life and career of Tom Jones, do join me then here on Red Rose. It's not unusual to be loved by anyone. So don't miss Tom Jones. 
Jones here on Red Rose Radio, Wednesday the 8th of April between 4 and 5. My Jove, I'll see you after midnight. Midnight News, this is Alan King. It's been revealed this evening that three more of the Queen's cousins were admitted to a Surrey mental hospital during the war. It was disclosed today that two of the Queen Mother's nieces have spent more than 40 years in the institution and one is still alive. Tonight, Surrey Health Authority announced that the nieces, three cousins, all sisters, were admitted to the hospital at the same time. Maud Stewart, the vice chairman of the Earlswood Hospital's League of Friends, who visits the Queen's relatives, says they all have a similar handicap. They have a mental age of about four. Mrs. Thatcher says the Russians really do want to get out of Afghanistan. She says her talks in Moscow with Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev have convinced her that a troop withdrawal is planned, but she doesn't believe it's imminent. At a dinner honouring the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mrs. Thatcher said she thought Mr. Gorbachev was the sort of man who can pull it off. There is a new mood in the Soviet Union. So far, we have seen few, very few signs of it in Soviet policy abroad. But I do not believe that foreign policy can be insulated from internal change. And I'm more hopeful as a result of my visit to Moscow that we shall see progress in Afghanistan. The Tories are again clear winners in the next general election, according to a new opinion poll. The Maury survey in the Times forecasts an overall Conservative majority of 92 seats. It's the fourth poll in three days, giving the Tories a big lead. The salvage team in Zeebrugge say they're on target to raise the herald of free enterprise in the morning. The team's boss, Hans Wallenkamp, has made a final inspection and pronounced himself satisfied. The situation is, uh, is OK. Uh, everything is going on according to schedule. We had some delay uh, Saturday night because of the increasing swell from the northwest. Uh, at the moment, the weather is excellent and uh, we hope uh, we're almost certain to start, let's say, early tomorrow morning. Junior Health Minister Edwina Curry is blaming macho beer drinkers for the country's alcohol problem. She's told an international conference in Liverpool that alcohol abuse is on the increase in Britain, though she says drink is all right in moderation. Snooker star Alex Hurricane Higgins has been banned from the sport for six months and fined a record £12,000 for headbutting a tournament official in Preston last year. Despite the ban, he will be allowed to play in the World Championship. Speaking on tonight's Wogan show, Higgins said the punishment could do him good. The truth of the matter is that I've decided to accept the punishment and come back fighting because it's the only action one can take. It can be a blessing in disguise, I would think, and respect it. It'll give me six months to sort of enjoy three rounds of golf a week. i never run away from punishment in my life. The National Union of Teachers says nearly 10,000 teachers will go on strike next week on half-day strikes. More than 500 schools in 13 areas of England and Wales will be hit by the dispute over the imposition by the government of a pay and conditions deal. Independent Radio News. <laughs> the sound you'll hear when you set sail on the world's most luxurious and prestigious liner, the QE2. And that's the sound of the money you'll save by booking an autumn cruise to Portugal at any branch of Ribble's National Travel World. Not only will you get the cruise of a lifetime on the QE2, but also luxury transport to and from Southampton, £25 to spend on board and lots more, all from only £395. Sounds unbelievable, but it's true. For more information, call into any branch of Ribble's National Travel World today. Hello there. With me today is uh, another Hoovermatic owner, Susan McGowan. Hello, Susan. Hello there. And of course, you uh, you use area in your Hoovermatic twin. Yes, don't you? I do. Any particular problems with your washing that you've got? Well, I have two babies, yeah. and uh, the oldest one, um, I just bought her a dress, and didn't put a bib on her, and she was getting tomato soup, which if anyone has used will know is the ultimate in bad stains. Really, that's the one. And I got the, the whole one. front of the dress. Well, I thought it was virtually ruined, and uh, my mother said, I'll tell you what, we'll get that out. Oh. And I got it out with Ariel, and when I put it out in the sunlight and brought it back in, I couldn't believe it was the same dress. So what did you feel then, Suzanne, when you uh, you took the dress off the line and you found that Ariel had really got it clean? That was me, hooked a fan. <laughs> Ring him if you dare. Alan Bessick, 
Four and a half minutes past midnight. Welcome to Tuesday. Preston 561000 if you wish to join us on the phone-in. And before we go on with the phone-in, just a little note that you may or may... I'm beginning to think that Mike Hemfield, the programme controller here at Red Rose Radio, has finally cracked. I think he's flipped his lid. He reckons it'll be a great idea if we take this programme out and do it from somebody's house. He's puddled, he's gone, he has, he's gone. I don't think the three bottles of gin he'd just swallowed helped. <laughs> but anyway, that's what he reckons. So we're going to take it out, we're going to take this here programme, Bezzy, and we're going to sit in somebody's lounge and do the whole programme from there. All we require from you is your lounge, your tea, and some cream buns. We want cream buns, don't we, Alice? We've got to have cream buns, get us through day. Absolutely, says Alice. So if you think you're suitable, and you'd like us to come and do this programme. We're only going to do it once, I promise you. <laughs> I mean, even Enfield can't make us do it twice. Uh, if, if you think your house and you are a good idea to do this phone-in with, then write to me and tell me why. And the most interesting reason, providing, providing the house is suitable, and that's nothing to do with your house, it's more to do with the electronics and all the other rubbish we have to have, but providing your house fits the bill then we'll do it at your house. The most interesting reason we shall do it. Drop us a line. It's Alan Bezick, Red Rose Radio, P.O. Box 301, Preston, pr one one y e And then lock up your daughters. 24 hours a day, Red Rose Radio. How <laughs> do, Neil? Hello, hello. Hello. I want to talk about the Labour Party's policy on education. Go on. Well, I agree they should put more money into it, but I don't think they should scrap, you know, people who want to pay for their children's education. I, I'm not aware that it is the policy of the Labour Party that they would scrap it. Yeah, they, they, they did. They said after two years of coming to power that they'd um, make it compulsory for state education. That isn't the same as scrapping private education. Well, yeah, because they're not going to let people be entitled to pay for it. No, what they're not going to allow people to... We have to get these things right, you see. What they're not going to allow people to do is to have a private education instead of a state education. I don't know that there is any plan to forbid them supplementing the state education with some other, in other words, having a Saturday school or a night school paid for out of their own pockets or their parents' pockets. Well, I don't think why they shouldn't be able to um, have one instead of the state system. Why should they? Tell me why a person should be entitled to opt out of the state system. So that the children can get a better education. What is your definition of a better education? Well, you know, getting better O-levels, better A-levels. No, that's a better result. What is a better education? You see, what you have to remember is, for example, some of the private schools turn in a better result. They get more O-level passes per pupil than, say, an ordinary comprehensive. But they have a qualification before you're allowed in. They test them and they weed out them that aren't going to provide better results. So there's no in my view, evidence to say that private education produces better results. If I went into a comprehensive school and took the top five pupils from every class and educated them in another specialist school that was just an ordinary free comprehensive, I feel sure that we would get better results then. Of well, course we would, because your, your top five people in the class are going to get better results than the bottom five. You still haven't told me why they shouldn't be allowed to go, though. You haven't told so, me why they so should. The best? You haven't told me why you should. I only argue against you. Well, why, why should someone be able to um, have a Porsche, say? Buy a Porsche car. If they can buy one of them, surely you can send your child to um, have a better education. It's a matter of opinion. Education is a basic requisite of life. I've yet to consider a Porsche or indeed any other motor car to be that. Yeah, well, the Labour Party, I mean, they want equality and that, and it's just not right. You can't have it's it. It's wrong mean, to want equality, is it? No. You're I'm... happy that people, for no simple reason other than the accident of their birth, are better off than you? Well, it's, unf it's just unfair and unlucky, isn't it? Isn't unlucky? It? 
you I mean, can do you can do something about it. There's nothing you're prepared to do about it. Well, that will yeah, accept. Well, what Russia's done then? What has Russia done? Well, everyone's miserable over there. That's that's a, a misconception foisted upon you by cheap, nasty little newspapers. I've been there. You've been there, and everybody, nobody smiled all the time you were there. Well, they're all pretty miserable. You get the odd one or two who smiles. Now I know you're talking garbage. How do Dorothy? Oh, hello, Alan. Hello. Um, can I ask your advice, please? You can ask. I don't know whether it'll do you any good, but you can ask. Oh. Well, um, the ba the bank have um, found the deeds of my of the house at last, and they've been insisting since 1981 that they didn't have them. And uh, my mother left me this house in 1984, and they just turned up last last year. Now, do you think I could charge, make them pay the solicitor's fees for all the inquiries they made? There's certainly an argument that says you could. The only problem is that your bank has probably not charged you for storing them. No, that's right. Now, in order for you to sue for compensation, you would first of all have had to have to prove the duty of care, the responsibility of care. Oh, I see, yes. Now, I don't know whether you can actually do that when they are doing you a favour. If they've got a contract with you, then maybe they could. But if they're doing you a favour, it's a bit difficult. I would discuss it with the solicitor him or herself. Yes. It's worth trying. Well, really speaking, they've had them since 1973. Well, how long they've had them and isn't... they've lost them. Yeah, how long they've had them isn't the issue. The issue isn't whether they lost them or how long they had them. It's whether you've got a right to compensation. Yes. You see, you can't, you can't sue me because I couldn't find them. If you said to me, look after them for us. Yes. And I said, all right, I will. And then I lost them for a while and then found them again. Any costs you incur as a result of that may not be reclaimable from me because you've not proven that it's my fault. You've not proven that I should have looked after them properly in the first place because you weren't paying me for doing it. Oh, I see. In other words, there was no contract between us. Bank charges made. Well, yes. if they if they've charged you for looking after them, then well, I would say. I'm not sure if they charge me money, is he? I, well, if they've charged, they, you see, the banks I've ever dealt with haven't charged for storing documents. They do it as a no. service to their customer. Now, if they have charged you, then there's a contract. Yes. There may well still be if they haven't charged you, but for that you'll need to discuss with your solicitor. Oh, I see. All right. All right, thank you. I wish you luck. Much, Getting money out of banks is easy if you've got a card, but if it's their money, it's not <laughs> yeah, so easy at all. Hard. All right, love. OK, Ta -ra. thank you. Aldo Stephen. Hello. Uh, there was a call on before talking about a medical experiment. Um, if he goes to a, a teaching hospital, you know, one with a, a medical school attached, and goes to the um, pharmacology department, he'd probably find that they do um, pay volunteers to experiment on them. And um, how it works, you know, using your example of... Um, uh, a drug for alleviating tachycardia, when well, a normal person it would probably, say, slow down the heart um, below the normal level. Do they call that bradycardia or something? But anyway, if he wants to do something useful that's different from that, um, perhaps he could get a, an organ um, donation card and carry that round if he hasn't gone and uh, <laughs> to topped himself on it. Yeah, well, it may well be that he should have done it last week because they'll all be available now. But <laughs> I don't think he was looking quite for that, but thank you for that information. OK. All right. Thanks. I'll do Ian. Hello? Yes. Um, I'd like to talk about the Zebra Ghostberry disaster, if I could, please. Go on. Well, I don't know whether you want to believe it or not, but I was actually on the ferry at the time of the disaster. And uh, I was in the bar at the time. And during the disaster, when the ferry actually tipped over on its left-hand side at the time, uh, all the glass actually shattered in the bar, and the bar is where I was at at the time. And all the glass shattering actually cut off my uh, penis, and I was wondering what you'd like to I thought, when you started and said that it fell to the left-hand side, I said to well, someone who's sat right next to me right now that I think it's fallen on its right-hand side, so I knew then you were a lying little cretin. But I was, for some stupid reason, giving you the credit for being reasonably intelligent in the hope that it would be some joke and not your perverse pleasure. 
But never mind, it, it's for everyone to get their rocks off how they must. I prefer girls myself. I'll do Joan. I'll do Alan. Uh, Alan, a fortnight ago, my fiance had a new engine in his car. Last Saturday night, somebody ran into the back and now it's a write-off. Can we, once the insurance is settled, can we buy the car back from the insurance company so that we can take it for salvage ourselves to get, you know, try and recoup the money for this engine? That's a matter between you and the insurance company. Oh, how do I go about it? Well, you'd have to write and ask them. Oh, it's as simple as that, is it? Just yeah. Right to the... Because as soon as they settle with you, yeah. they own the car. Of course, yeah. And they normally give them to scrap, or sell them to scrap dealers. Yeah. Obviously, if you're going to give them a few more quid, they might be interested. To be honest, I very much doubt it, but no. write and ask anyway. Okay. Failing that, ask them to tell you which scrap dealer they've sent it to, yeah, that's and you'll go and get the engine. Yeah. But of course, if all he's got is the money for the crash, the engine might not be worth out. No, that's it. Because an engine, when it's brand new, is worth a fixed amount of money. Yeah. But as soon as you've put some oil in it and driven it around the block, it's a second-hand engine. Yeah, it's no better or worse than any other. If it's done only 120 miles when they... But, but, you've, the but, you've, off. but you've got to convince the sucker that is hoping to buy it of that. Yeah. You've got to say, it's only done 100 miles, and he says, yeah, how do I know? Yeah, and you okay. say, he's got 11,000 on the clock. And he says, yeah, yeah great. Because <laughs> 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 in those positions, Joe, and I don't think I'd believe you. No. Especially if you're going to ask anywhere near the price of a new one. Because he'll say, well, I don't need this risk. I'll go and get a 12-month guarantee, pay 30 quid and get a brand new one. Yeah. 30 yeah. quid above what you're asking, in other words. Mm. All right. Yeah. I wish you luck with it. Thanks a lot, love. Bye. Carpets. Red ones, green ones, yellow and blue. We've got the carpets just for you. At the Carpet Supermarket, Fletcher Road off Ribbleton Lane, Preston. Open seven days a week. Also at Long Lane Aintree. Hello children! Can you guess which windows we will look through today? That's right, we're looking through rainbow windows. And what can we see? Top quality UPVC windows, double glazed and expertly fitted. Look at that one, 4x4, only £168 plus VAT. And this one, 8x4 foot 6, only £255 plus VAT. And this one isn't a window at all. It's a door with 5 point locking system, only £260 plus VAT. Now, tell your mum and dad to ring rainbow windows, quick, on Blackpool 62970. Red Rose Family Care Line, in association with JMAX, clothing stores throughout the Northwest. Care Line doesn't claim to solve your difficulties, but we can help you to help yourself. The Care Line team is trained to advise on how to cope with life's everyday problems. So ring us in complete confidence. There's someone waiting to listen on Preston 24006. Red Rose Care Line, in association with JMAX. J Northwest. Capital Ceilings have got to be your number one choice in Wigan for quality suspended ceilings. Prices start at just £26 and Capital Ceilings are suitable for the home, office or factory. Contact Capital Ceilings today and find out more. Or call into their showrooms in Caroline Street, Wigan, next to B&Q. Ring Wigan 496 428. Wigan 496 428. Capital Ceilings, your number one choice in Wigan. Hello, Shirley. Hello, Alan. I wonder if you could help me, please. Uh, I split up from my common-law husband uh, last month and left uh, our home, which is in joint names, uh, with my two children. He was very violent towards me. Uh, and the house went up for sale a couple of weeks after. Um, now, I've been to my solicitor today to ask if I can move back into the house with my children. Uh, she said yes, but he would have to stay in the house as well. Um... Now, I've been down and asked him for a key to move back in, and he won't let me have one. Uh, and a friend has offered to change the locks tomorrow for me so I can move back in. Is this against the law if I offered him a key so he could still come into the house as well? The simple answer to your question is no, it is not against the law. Yeah. You are both entitled to yeah. free access. Yeah. By that, I mean ordinary access like you or I have in our homes normally. Yeah. So what's yours is yours what's his is his but unfortunately the house is both of yours yeah. so you're both entitled to access you are as entitled to change the locks as is he mm. i've got to say you're putting yourself in risk not of some legal ramification but you've already said that he's a, a violent man yeah. well this is why i can't understand the, the solicitor said that he can stay in the house and i have got proof at the moment he can 
the courts can change that status yeah. quo and it would need your solicitor to take some action. Yeah. The courts would want hard evidence yeah. of the assaults. Yeah. In other words, if, and I hope above all, ho all other hopes that he doesn't, but if he assaults you or the children as a result of your changing the locks, mm -hmm. then go to a doctor yeah. and get medical evidence yeah. of the injuries you've sustained. Yeah and go to your solicitor and get a court injunction forbidding him access to the, well, what is normally called the matrimonial home. Mm. In this case, it wouldn't be because there isn't a matrimony. But get him forbidden access. Yeah. Well, uh, I did mention this to her, and she said it would, they would get an injunction on him. Mm -hmm. um, but she said it would probably only last about three months, and then he'd be able to move back into the house. She's. It, it's a solicitor's job mm. to paint you the blackest picture. Yeah. They, it, other solicitors would say, nah, you'll be all right, and they would be wrong. Mm. It's right that your solicitor says to you, these are the potential. It isn't inevitable that that would happen. Yeah. Once the court injunction has expired, there are cases where the injunction has then been not continued, but a new one taken out to replace yeah. it. OK? OK. I wish you luck. Thank but keep you. in contact with your solicitor. Oh, Don't... Uh, the house is up for sale, I did mention. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, how will we go on about that? Would it need both our permission to take the house off the market? It doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you a swizzle now. Yeah. It is probably perfectly correct that your common-law husband has put the house on the market. Yeah. When anyone comes to see it, particularly if he's no longer resident there, mm. should you get the injunction, should you be successful in getting an injunction and forbidding him access, yeah. when anyone comes to see the house, show them round and explain to them that obviously you don't want to move and you will be resisting any chance of, or any, any attempt to get you out of the house, you'll be resisting. Yeah. And in this day and age, they'll run a mile. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be bothered. Yeah. Right? Right. So, okay. that's how you deal with that. I don't think that is a perfectly legal answer, but it, it doesn't have work. Yeah. All right, love. Right. Thanks very much. Right. Thank you. Bye. I'll do, Susan. Hello, Alan. Yep. There was a man on earlier um, talking about the minimum wage. Yes. Uh, I work a 40-hour week as a cook at a small rest home for £102 a week, and this is about as much as I can earn. Um, if I go on strike, there are 10 old people that will go without food. You know, I just think his argument was wrong to expect um, a wage of £120. Well, well was, it, was he wrong to expect a wage no, of £120? No, not wrong, but he's, he's... He wasn't actually advocating that you went on strike. Indeed, I remember that call well, and the man actually said at some case during the convers at he some point during the conversation... Himself, didn't he? Well, I don't think he did exactly, but it, he certainly said at some stage during the conversation that there are people who should not go on strike. Mm. But he also said that the state should create a minimum wage so that those individuals have no need to go on strike. Yeah, but... Now, if the law was passed in the, what now looks like the unlikely event of the Labour Party getting into power, if they passed a law saying that there is a minimum wage of £120 a week and anybody wanting to employ an individual must pay them that amount of money as a minimum, then you would immediately benefit. Mm. Because your employer, whilst they may well be able to replace you with another cook, if they do so, they will have to replace you with another cook for a minimum 120. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that, surely. No, but he was also saying that um, you've qualified and reached the top of your tree. Um, you should be able to get £120 a week. Mm. Um, but I am qualified. I've done four years. But that's what he's saying. Yeah. It is un unfair, it's unfair and indeed unjust that you're paid less than £120 a week, which mm. he, and to be honest, me, considers not to be anything other than a, a reasonable wage. Mm. And I earn considerably more than £120 a week. I don't think I could these days live on £120 a week. But no, people have to, with families and the like. Yeah, it is very difficult to live on. Right. On, on such so, a what our earlier caller was arguing was that you should be entitled to that as a minimum. He wasn't saying we should all get that. He was saying a lot of us should get a damn sight more. Yeah. Indeed, everybody should. But they should create a minimum wage of 120. Well, maybe I, I misunderstood him. I only caught the, half of his conversation with you. <laughs> That's because I was butting in. 
<laughs> anyway. How unusual. <laughs> oh, can I congratulate you on a good programme as you well? You can if you like, but you'll be lying. <laughs> All right, no, love. No, I'm not. <laughs> okay, right. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. How do you, John? How do you, Alan? Um, it's about divorce. Uh, I've been separated uh, nine years, and I was just wondering whether I have to let my wife know that, you know, I'm divorcing her. You know what I mean? You can obtain a divorce without her consent yeah. after five years of separation, but I still think, if you know where she is, that you are required to give her details to the court, because you can't just divorce her without telling her, because she might want to get married herself. Yeah, well, I want to get married myself, you know what I mean? Mm. You know, so... I just didn't know, you know, what to... Well, the, the process of getting a divorce in circumstances such as yours is A, very cheap, B, very simple. But you will have to give details of where your wife is resident. Yeah. So that they can serve the summons on her, so that she at least knows what's going on. Right, OK. You know, if, uh, you know, could she have already divorced me without letting me know? She might have done. Again, if she did do, then she might have lied. You see... You only ever get divorced for one reason, and that is the irretrievable breakdown of a marriage. All these things that we cite as reasons for divorce are not reasons at all. They're evidence that the marriage is broken down. Now, five years' separation is usually regarded as desertion. That's, that's the general term for it. It's not accurate, but that's the term. The marriage is obviously over. They've not lived together, not been in contact for five years. They're hardly going to get back together, are they? Oh, now, in those circumstances, if the wife did not know where the husband was, then she, should, she could get a divorce without notifying the husband simply because she didn't know where he was. But if she did know where he was, she has an obligation to tell the court. If I remember correctly, it's a long time since I filled in divorce forms. Yeah, right. OK? OK, right. There's a very good book on it. It's a pamphlet. It's available free of charge from your local court, your local county court, that is, the Families Division, and it's entitled simply Undefended Divorce, and it explains it in detail. Right, okay. okay. Right, you can also get a witch magazine. <laughs> it goes on, doesn't it? Yeah. You can also get a witch magazine publication entitled Divorce, and that will tell you how to go through it as well. Right, okay. Okay? Right, thanks Cheers. for that. How do Jason? Hey, do I? I'd like to talk about the Queen's secret cousin. How come that she's been locked away for 40 years and everybody thinks she's dead? The reason people believe that cousin to be dead, and indeed her sister, who now is dead, is because the Burke's peerage actually said that they were dead. What? Burke's peerage is the authoritative publication about the aristocracy. Well, what proof did they have that she was dead? They don't have proof. What happens is the Burke's peerage compiler sends a document, a, a, basically just a form, to the head of various households, the aristocracy households, and asks the head of the household for certain information, and then publishes that information. And it would appear that somewhere along the line, the Bose Lion, is it, family, have lied and Burke's peerage have either not noticed it, to give them the benefit of the doubt, or have gone al along with it. Oh. That's how it's come about. Someone somewhere has lied, and someone somewhere has failed to spot the lie, either by doing the Nelson trick and turning a blind eye, or by being basically incompetent. But it certainly injures one faith in the Burke's peerage. If I was a regular purchaser of it, I wouldn't buy it again. I can get lies on this programme. I don't need to get them out of a bloody 60 quid book. Oh, right. OK? I don't know that it is a 60 quid book, but I know they don't give it away. All right. Yeah. See ya. At SKD Typewriters, we have several brothers. The brother range of electronic and portable typewriters, plus stationery, calculators, office equipment, office furniture, and a full range of copying machines. That's why SKD Typewriters are called the Electronic Business Machine Centre of the North West. Access Visa and Part Exchange welcome at SKD Typewriters, 71 to 75 Railway Road, Lee. Ring Lee 603326. SKD Typewriters and Brother, the future at your fingertips. Away, away, on an Avalon holiday. We'll all have fun lying in the sun on an Avalon holiday. 
Avalon Travel in conjunction with DFDS Seaways invite you to Legoland, a holiday packed with adventure and fun for all the family. Departing the 28th of June on a four-day mini-cruise, staying in superb hotel accommodation. You'll have a holiday of a lifetime in Denmark and with your visit to Legoland. The price just £109 all in. This holiday is on a first-come, first-served basis, so hurry before it's too late. Ring Avalon Travel now on Bolton 398 788. Bolton 398 788. Uncle Joe has always been a sucker for the nicer things in life. That's why, one sunny day, it was decided that Uncle Joe would create a masterpiece. And masterpiece it was. The Uncle Joe's Mint Ball was born and has been with us for almost a century. And he'll tell you, if you try an Uncle Joe's Mint Ball, you'll find it very hard not to try another one. Uncle Joe's Mint Balls, traditional quality, and now available in a handy 75 gram pack with no artificial additives. Buy some today. How do, Mark? Hello, Alan. Uh, I'd like to ask you uh, what you think about the government expenditure on into uh, AIDS research. What do you think about it? Um, well, at first I thought it was a good thing, and then uh, we both, my brother contracted the virus. Well, they don't know when they said the past three years, and uh, he's not actually suffering yet. But uh, anyway, uh, I went to this pub in Birkenhead called the Pleasure Joe, and they were giving out free condoms, no, but the government were. And I, th I thought you were having to pay ten pence. <clears throat> no, they were free. Oh, I thought they were ten pence. Free, I um, saw the news this evening. I was sure I gleaned that. Yes, yeah, I did. Uh, but the, no, the DJ took some out at the, at the public. I thought, well, they're promoting sex, promoting the spread of the disease. Well, are they promoting sex? I mean, to be honest, I've got a file in my toolkit at home, and I've never filed a damn thing since I left school. Just because you've got the equipment doesn't mean you've got to do it. Yeah, but even so, it's a waste of money. Uh, well, I, I'm prepared to accept that if somebody gives you something that you don't use, the person that gave it to you is wasting their money. But that doesn't mean that they're making you use it. Just because you got one of the damn things doesn't mean you have to wear it. Well, they're condoning it, aren't they? Condoning liberal sex. Well, they're certainly condoning it. Uh, yeah, he went to the doctors, he's been a few times to counselling, and uh, he's been told that there's nothing that they can do at all, when in fact there is a drug. Well, perhaps what should have happened, however long ago it was, uh -huh. someone should have given him a condom, and then he wouldn't have it. No, he's, he's, I think he's got to him, uh, go through drugs. Ah, well, well uh, I don't think you get it through drugs, to be honest. Well, the needles, rather, the syringes. Well, that's what the syringes. Oh, from, from from drug abuse? Well, yeah. So well, happen he got it because he deserves it, then? Well, that's not, I'm not, that's not the case that I'm issuing. Mean, I'm trying to just... Uh, well, I, I accept, but I, I'm just saying in passing that a drug addict that gets AIDS through sharing needles, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not over-sympathetic. They deserve it. I think it's rotten that they're then going to pass it on to some poor, unsuspecting person. But I've got no sympathy for the drug well, addict themselves. If they die from it, then fine, let them get on and die. I'm not over-bothered. We can live without drug addicts, thank you very much. Well, this was like three years ago that happened. He's not a regular drug user. He's, you know, I think it was just a one-off at a party. And well, it's too bad. He's going to die anyway. Well, I, I agree with the... I, you know, we've had lots of discussion about it. And I think... It, well, yeah, it's tough.